Chapter 2 of Gleanings of a Mystic, a series of essays on practical mysticism by Max Heindel. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter 2 Initiation What It Is and Is Not. Part 2 To obtain a better understanding of what constitutes initiation and what the prerequisites are, let the student first fix firmly in his mind the fact that humanity as a whole is slowly progressing upon the path of evolution, and thus very slowly, almost imperceptibly, attaining higher and higher states of consciousness. The path of evolution is a spiral when we regard it from the physical side only, but a lemniscate when viewed in both its physical and spiritual phases. See the diagram of chemical caduceus in the Rosicrucian Cosmo Conception, page 410. In the Lemnus Gate, or figure 8, there are two circles which converge to a central point, which circles may be taken to symbolize the immortal spirit, the evolving ego. One of the circles signifies its life in the physical world from birth to death. During this span of time it sows a seed by every act and should reap in return a certain amount of experience. But as we may sow seed in the field and lose return on that which falls on stony ground, among thorns, etc., so also may the seed of opportunity be wasted because of neglect to till the soil and the life will then be barren of fruit. Conversely, as diligence and care in cultivation increase the productive power of garden seed enormously, so earnest application to the business of life, improvement of opportunities to learn life's lessons and extract from our environment the experience it holds, brings added opportunities, and at the end of the life day the ego finds itself at the door of death laden with the richest fruits of life. The objective work of physical existence, over the race run, and the day of action spent, the ego enters upon the subjective work of assimilation accomplished during its sojourn in the invisible worlds, which it traverses during the period from death to birth, symbolized by the other ring of the lemniscate. As the method of accomplishing this assimilation has been most minutely described in various parts of our literature, it is needless to repeat it here. Suffice it to say that at the time when an ego arrives at the central point in the Lemnus Gate, which divides the physical from the psychic worlds, and which we call the gate of birth or death, according to whether the ego is entering or leaving the realm where we ourselves happen to be at the time, it has with it an aggregate of faculties or talents acquired in all previous lives, which it may then put to usury or bury during the coming life day as it sees fit. But upon the use it makes of what it has depends the amount of soul growth it makes. If for many lives it caters mainly to the lower nature, which lives to eat, drink, and be merry, or if it dreams its life away in metaphysical speculations upon nature and God, sedulously abstaining from all unnecessary action, it is gradually passed and left behind by the more active and progressive. Great companies of these idlers form what we know as backward races, while the active, alert, and wide awake who improve a larger percentage of their opportunities are the pioneers. Contrary to the commonly accepted idea, this applies also to those engaged in industrial work. Their money-getting is only an incident, an incentive, and entirely apart from this phase their work is as spiritual as, or even more so than that, of those who spend their time in prayer to the prejudice of useful work. From what has been said, it will be clear that the method of soul growth as accomplished by the process of evolution requires action in the physical life, followed in the post-mortem state by a ruminating process during which the lessons of life are extracted and thoroughly incorporated into the consciousness of the ego, though the experiences themselves are forgotten, as we forget our labor in learning the multiplication table, though the faculty of using it remains. This exceedingly slow and tedious process is perfectly suited to the needs of the masses, but there are some who habitually exhaust the experiences commonly given, thus requiring and meriting a larger scope for their energies. 
difference of temperament is responsible for their division into two classes. One class, led by their devotion to Christ, simply follow the dictates of the heart in their work of love for their fellows, beautiful characters, beacon lights of love in a suffering world, never actuated by selfish motives, always ready to forego personal comfort to aid others. Such were the saints. They worked as they prayed. They never shirked in either direction. Nor are they dead today. The earth would be a barren wilderness in spite of all its civilization did not their beautiful feet circle it on errands of mercy, were not the lives of sufferers made brighter by the light of hope which radiates from their beautiful faces. Had they but the knowledge possessed by the other class, they would indeed outdistance all in the race for the kingdom. Mind is the predominating feature of the other class. In order to aid it in its efforts toward attainment, mystery schools were early established, wherein the world drama was played to give the aspiring soul, while he was entranced, answers to the questions of the origin and destiny of humanity. When awakened, he was instructed in the sacred science of how to climb higher by following the method of nature, which is God in manifestation, by sowing the seed of action, meditating upon the experience, and incorporating the essential moral to make thereby commensurate soul growth. Also with this important feature, that whereas in the ordinary course of things a whole life is devoted to sowing, and a whole post-mortem existence to ruminating and incorporating the soul substance, this cycle of a thousand years, more or less, may be reduced to a day, as held by the mystic maxim. A day is as a thousand years, and a thousand years as one day. To be explicit, whatever work has been done during a single day, if ruminated over at night before crossing the neutral point between waking and sleeping, may thus be incorporated into the consciousness of the spirit as usable soul power. When that exercise is faithfully performed, the sins of each day thus reviewed are actually blotted out, and the man commences each day as if it were a new life, with the added soul power gained in all the preceding days of his probationary life. But, Yes, there is a great big but. Nature is not to be cheated. God is not to be mocked. Whatsoever a man soweth, that shall he also reap. Let no one think that the mere perfunctory review of the happenings of a day, with perhaps the light-hearted admission of, I wish I had not done that, when reviewing a scene where he did something palpably wrong, will save him from the wrath to come. When we pass out of the body into purgatory at death, and the panorama of our past life unfolds in reverse order to show us first the effects and then the causes which produced them, we feel in intensified measure the pain we gave others, and unless we perform our exercises in a similar manner, so that we live each evening our hell has merited that day, acutely sensible of every pang we have inflicted, it will avail nothing. We must also endeavor to feel in the same intense manner gratitude for kindness received from others, and approbation on account of the good we ourselves have done. Only thus are we really living in the post-mortem existence and advancing scientifically towards the goal of initiation. The greatest danger of the aspirant upon this path is that he may become enmeshed in the snare of egotism and his only safeguard is to cultivate the faculties of faith, devotion, and an all-embracing sympathy. It is difficult, but it can be done, and when it has been accomplished, the man or woman becomes a wonderful power for good in the world. Now, if the student has pondered the preceding argument well, he has probably grasped the analogy between the long cycle of evolution and the short cycles or steps used upon the path of preparation. It should be quite clear that no one can do this post-mortem work for him and transmit to him the resulting soul growth any more than one can eat the physical food of another and transmit to him the sustenance and growth. You think it preposterous when a priesthood offers to shorten the sojourn of a soul in purgatory. How, then, can you believe that anyone else can, no matter what the consideration, 
obviate the necessity of a number of purgatorial existences for your benefit and transmit to you at once the usable soul power you would have acquired had you pursued the ordinary course of life to the day you are ready for initiation yet this is what the offer to initiate a person not yet upon the threshold means you must have the soul power requisite for initiation or no one can initiate you if you have it you are upon the threshold by your own efforts beholden to no one and may demand initiation as a right which none would dare dispute or withhold if you have it not and could buy it it would be cheap at twenty five million dollars and the man who offers it for twenty five dollars is as ridiculous as his dupe please remember that if anyone offers to initiate you into an occult order no matter if he calls it rosicrucian or by any other name his demand of an initiation fee at once stamps him as an impostor explanations to the effect that the fee is used to purchase regalia etc are only added evidence of the fraudulent nature of the order for it is said initiation is most emphatically not an outward ceremony but an inward experience i may further add that the elder brothers of the rosy cross in the mystic temple where i received the light made it a condition that their sacred science must never be put in the balance against a coin freely i had received and freely was i required to give this injunction i have obeyed both in spirit and to the letter as all know who have had dealings with the rosicrucian fellowship End of chapter 2